It's the Jim Fannin Show. We've come to take your mind. Am I still on? And if you could just unmute your mic for me, brother. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. We've spoken before, but I uh, always appreciate touching you up to see what you're up to. How are you My feeling? Pleasure. How are you feeling? Things are good. Yeah. Things are good. Yeah. What are you working on these days? Uh, so, well, there's, there's the podcast and uh, Quillette was my main gig. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also few book projects oh. uh, uh it's i generally like to have at least one or two book projects going on on the side because uh, those are the things that kind of take me into uh, just they give me no choice but to, to learn new things right. uh because i'm they're usually about kind of just ra- random subjects and uh, it, they're the things that keep me from just like writing or podcasting about the same half dozen subjects over and over mm-hmm what do you seem to be passionate about these days as far as subjects go? I mean, thank God for you on Twitter, man. I find you to be one of the most entertaining Twitter accounts. And I was telling Andy Lee last week, everything that starts with, that, that comes from Jonathan Kay's account that starts with, as a Jew, is gold, period. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, my Twitter account is, is kind of deceptive because sometimes people listen to my podcast and they sort of, expect that my podcast is just going to be like non-stop snark uh, because like Twitter, there, there's just so many things that, that are in the news these days that the only reaction, sensible reaction for me is just exasperation, uh, satire, because if, if you just kind of freak out in a <laughs> endlessly, um, it's going to be exhausting. So yeah. Sometimes people read my articles and, and they, they listen to my podcast and they kind of expect like it's going to be an extension of that sort of Twitter snark. Right. Um, and, and, and it's not. So I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons that I enjoy coming on podcasts like this, because it gives people an opportunity to see that my, my Twitter persona is, I wouldn't say it's fake. I mean, it's, it's who I am. I'm kind of a, a satirist, but it's, it's, it's not as if I, I go around all day in that, uh, in that voice, it's just like constantly making fun of things. Well, yeah, it's, uh, I say this often too. It's, you know, I say things on Twitter and Facebook and social media that you, you think that I actually walk up to people and say these things in real life. Like this is the, the, the Twitter account is not a human being. I think many people forget that. And I get caught up in that too, because you see these Twitter accounts and they cause you to kind of rage a little bit, but, uh, you know, they are not humans. They're, you know, they're controlled by a human, but they're not, they're not humans. They're, they're social media accounts. And I think we forget that. And I would say that in my experience, uh, people are actually much nicer, uh, than, than sometimes their Twitters would indicate, uh, like, so in my neighborhood. So, you know, I tell people, I, I live in the neighborhood of Toronto that has, it happens to be an NDP neighborhood. Uh, there are a lot of people in my neighborhood 
neighborhood who maybe know me through media or whether social media or otherwise. And, and, and I, I happen to know that like they have very different political attitudes toward me. I, I've never once had a bad or nasty encounter in my neighborhood. Um, I, I find when, when people encounter me in my neighborhood, whether it's in the store or in the schoolyard or something like that, mm-hmm. um, no, it, it could be that that's because they see me before I see them and they, uh, steer clear of me, right. you know, which is fine. Like it's, right. you don't, you don't have to say hi to everybody. Um, but like, I've never had a, a single sort of nasty personal episode in, in my neighborhood, despite the fact there's actually a lot of media people and academics and stuff in my neighborhood. Uh, so, and which, which teaches me something about these other people that, you know, just as, as I don't want to be defined by my, my sort of snarky online persona, I mm-hmm. try to remember the same about other people who I disagree with, who, who I meet in real life. Now tell me about your political journey. Have you always, like, I don't know where to class you, like, you seemed like I, I say I've seemed to have some of the same political leanings that you do, but I've been red pilled over the last, I don't know, six years. I was, you know, I was a 10 time Green Party guy, but I always say that was before the, the left went mad. And now I'm, you know, I can't get with anything that the left is doing, whether it be the Democrats in the States or the liberals in Canada. I just wondered, you know, have you always been cemented in your political ideological leaning or have you had a like a journey? I mean, the you know we look at the spectrum it's shifted quite drastically the le- especially in the left side of it i think maybe the right's been more stable than the left but tell me about your political journey have you always had the same leanings or have you f- kind of evolved as you've gotten older so i think uh there are, there are people who are strongly ideological and they're driven by ideology um i i definitely don't fall into that category uh i'm i'm sort of a lifelong contrarian uh, and w- what tends to happen is that I tend to be in a kind of environment where I see um, political manias or I see what I regard as extremism or I see ideological, like call it dogmatism, people really taking ideas, and sometimes they're good ideas, but just taking ideas too far. Um, and and I, I tend to rebel against it. And and because these these acts of rebellion have led me in different directions. Um, it, it's meant that I've kind of, def- I guess I define myself more in terms of, of opposition to, to, to radical doctrines. Like when, when I was at the national post, which is a conservative newspaper here in Canada, and I, I don't presume to know it's a podcast. So I, I don't presume that it, everyone listening is in Canada. Uh, you know, for, for a long time, I worked at a conservative newspaper and I was known as sort of a left-wing contrarian at that newspaper because I agreed with a lot of stuff they were doing, but I also, you know, was uncomfortable with a lot of stuff that, mm-hmm. that you know, came to global warming and uh, income inequality. And like, there were certain issues that I staked out positions on the left. Uh, and then after that, I went to a, to a magazine, which was, I think, left of center, even by Canadian standards. And uh, they didn't know what to do with me there because I was, I was very much, I rebelled against some of the stuff that I saw some of my colleagues not just my colleagues, but like this, this sort of general, there's this thing in Canada called Canlit, which is sort of like the Canadian literary sphere. Um, and it's this subculture that can, if you let it, will impose some, some very monolithic, um, set of beliefs on you, including some stuff that I find really silly. And, and I kind of, you know, as anybody who follows me on social media will know, like, I don't, I have a very difficult time holding my tongue in that kind of env- environment and just like nodding my head and saying oh, okay yeah oh sure whatever you know um I, I tend to to pipe up and say well yeah that, kind of, that's, that sounds nuts like I don't believe that and so in that environment I was people saw me as a conservative but I, I don't really see myself as a conservative I was just somebody who who pipes up when he when when he hears crazy stuff that's from progressives but I've, I've also done that when, you know, when I hear anti-vaxxers go off, you know, conservative anti-vaxxers go off. I, I've lost thousands of followers on Twitter because I have absolutely no time for anti-vaxxers. And um, does, that, that doesn't mean like my ideological view on the world is, is fixated on like public health or, you know, pro-vax sentiments. I just, again, I'm sort of a professional contrarian. I, I like to point out when people are going overboard with either conspiracy theories or 
where they're just getting too preachy. Like, I love Canada. It's a wonderful place. But like the political class, the academic class, even the journalistic Canada, uh, class in Canada, it's just like very preachy. So when when they, a critical mass of people in, in, in those professional classes think they know what everybody should think, like about the Freedom Convoy or about public health or about, you know, who to vote for um, or about like who's problematic to follow on social media, this sort of herd mentality takes over and they become like this very hectoring puritanical um, force within the marketplace of ideas. And I just, everything about me, I just rebel against that. And the, the fact that I rebel against that constantly I think to some extent has defined my persona um, in in that marketplace of ideas here in Canada. But it's not, it doesn't really fall anywhere on the left-right spectrum. It's more, I would say it's more a personality trait than it is mm -hmm. a political philosophy. Interesting, yeah, because I see, like, I mean, I, I come from a left-leaning political uh, this left-leaning political spectrum as well, but I think, you know, over time I was just red-pilled, and, uh, you know, I've been in Dominican Republic for a year now. I never thought I'd leave my country. I love my country, but when Justin Trudeau said you couldn't leave the country, I'm like, well, shit, I need to get out of here, you know? Like, I just, you know, and I don't consider myself an anti-vaxxer. I've been vaccine, I took a vaccine before as a kid and stuff like that, but I never took the flu shot, and I, you know, I'm going to take my chances with I'm not taking my chances with the new shot. I take my chances with COVID for that matter. And I, I don't think I've been sick yet, but you know, it's like, you know, I think we, we spend a lot of time labeling people and uh, social media is a great place for that. And that's what I like about you. It seems like you're, you're balanced. You, you equally criticize the extremes on both sides and, and I'm with you there. I just think that the left has kind of gone mad now. But it's especially. not, you know, it, even basic terminology, but left and right, um, you know, give you an example. So I live near Broadview subway station in Toronto and there were these people picketing Broadview subway station. I think, I think it was yesterday. Uh, so I'm speaking to you on October 13th. Uh, it was either yesterday or the day before. And it was like a guy in a tweet and they said, uh, I think it was like free the TTC. That's the Toronto transit commission. It's, it's the, 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 the subway and the buses here. Like they wanted the the fare to be free. like anyone can socialists. They had signs that said they're socialists. And I can't tell you how refreshing it was to see like real leftists actually protesting something they cared about. Like these were people, they are just from the way they presented and they, they weren't wealthy people, they, they looked like they were kind of working class people protesting something on the basis of social class. You know, their signs were saying like poor people can't afford public transportation. They free the TTC. Again, I don't particularly agree with it, but it was refreshing to see somebody on the left who was like talking about a real issue. And it wasn't some misgendered him or that, you know, I don't know. Um, he felt unsafe when he went to a store because he saw somebody wearing like a MAGA hat or something like that. Like it, it was a real issue and not a complaint about representational symbolism, which is the kind of thing now that, that, that dominates on social media and which, which dominates the discourse among many progressives, which is, you know, about what hashtags you're allowed to use, what emojis are, allowed, are you allowed to use, what pronouns uh, we should be using, which, are entirely symbolic issues which present as progressive or left-wing but really have nothing to do with the lives of, of, of ordinary working class people uh and so you know sometimes people you know a lot of my writers at quillette will say like oh i used to be a leftist um but now i don't know what happened and Sometimes their explanation is like, well, you know, the left became crazy or whatever, but it's, I'm not even sure it's that because the left, as we knew it, maybe 15 or even 10 years ago, it's kind of evaporated. Mm. Uh, I mean, take, you know, the NDP, so that's the far left, well, I don't know if far left, but you know, it's a left wing party here in Canada, at the federal and provincial level. The NDP has embedded in its party constitution represented by tr representation by trade unions. You know, this is a party that that used to be like kind of run by and for tr people in you know steelworkers 
uh, working class people who who are in the trades. And now the party seems to have contempt for those people because those people don't speak the language of you know uh, intersectional hashtagery. They don't they don't speak the idiom the academic idioms which more and more have taken over progressive discourse. And you know Jagmeet Singh was the leader of the NDP. This is a guy you know he occupies the same position that Jack Layton this is this hallowed. Uh, now passed away leader of the NDP, you know, both, both of them NDP leaders, but they might as well be from different planets in terms of the language they use, in terms of the people that they're trying to, to go after. Um, it's it's no longer trying to attract ordinary working class people. Um, it's, it's more and more uh, trying to sell yourself to a highly digital laptop class that exists on social media and, and creating memes for those people to create the illusion of uh, a mass movement. Can you center me up just a little bit there? I to give me a little bit more left. You're going off the screen a little bit on that. Right that yeah. <laughs> if, if it's no trouble. Yeah, uh, speak to me about the state of uh, media in Canada, how you see it. You're in the business. You're an editor for, uh, you know, a pretty popular, uh, can you, would you call it an alternative magazine, Quillette? And yeah, just give me your take on, on how you see how media shift, how it's different today, and, and your concerns about it, if you have any. You must have some. I don't think, uh, I mean, it's possible. So Quillette is an Australian publication. I, so I live in Canada. I don't really consider myself a Canadian journalist because Quillette is Australian. And um, and one of the things I like about working for a non-Canadian media company is, is I don't have to obey the rules, you know, set down in the little treehouse of, of Canadian media. Um, you know, what you're allowed to say and what positions you're, you're supposed to be taking. Uh, I don't think Quillette really qualifies as alternative media because, I mean, it, so it's been around for seven years. It might have qualified as alternative media originally, but now, um, you know, to the extent that people and outlets are defined by their enemies, most of the complaints Quillette gets now are, are from, like, conservatives who say, oh, you know, Quillette is, like, full of gatekeepers and you know, they only publish academics and um, they're snobs. Um, and, you know, they, uh, you know, my, my, my boss is, is a very strong vaccine supporter. I happen to be a strong vaccine supporter. We've, you know, we've been criticized by, by, by conservatives, you know, like we're very strongly pro-Ukraine. Um, so like a lot of our positions are fairly, uh, fairly mainstream. And, and there are a lot of people who consider themselves Sort of connoisseurs of alternative media and, and they have no time for us because they they just see us as part of the mainstream uh and you know and to be fair they're 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 kind of right now like it's you know seven years is a long time in media and um like it, it used to be kind of exceptional when the new york times would would quote quillette but now it, it happens it's happened fairly regularly and so now we're seen as sort of part of the establishment for better mm -hmm. or worse and for a lot of people, that's for worse because they mm -hmm. they see us as having been co-opted by the establishment. Um, that said, uh, in Canada in particular, which has such a kind of cloistered sort of clubby uh, journalistic class, um, especially when it comes to like covering issues, you know, the Freedom Convoy, I think, brought that out in, in <laughs> uh, vividly. Um, you know, there was it was it was very clear that there was like this sort of things you were supposed to say about the Freedom Convoy, and if you didn't say them, um, you know, they are going to take away your Treehouse uh, club card. And there are some outlets now in Canada, which, you know, they've been around for a couple of years now, which is a long time in journalism. You have Post Millennial, you have True North, uh, you had the Rebel. Uh, Rebel, I, I find... Well, at least originally when I was reading it a couple of years ago, like I, I found that pretty extreme. Like some of the stuff about Islam, I, I just absolutely could not get behind. It was, I found it was way out there. Um, but it makes money. So there are people who complain. It's like, oh, you know, there's there's this um, established media. And if you're not in the established media, you can't get your message out. That is absolutely not true anymore. Um, true North gets tons of hits. Post Millennial gets tons of hits. There's podcasts like this one. I realize it's you're not situated in Canada anymore, but it sounds like a, a ton of your listeners are, are Canadian. Um, you know, my Quillette podcast, uh, uh, 
most of my listeners aren't in Canada, but I have at least 10,000 listeners every week when I broadcast. And, you know, by Canadian standards, that's it's not huge, but it's it's sizable. So, and then Substack has really changed the game. Uh, if you have a, a if you have a popular message, you have something to say, uh, you know, Substack has really made it easy to um, to to go to go it alone. I mean, and that comes with risks because sometimes you go it alone, you drink your own Kool-Aid, you start to publish some wacky stuff. But for people who are disciplined, uh, Substack, I, I think, has been a, few, a huge game changer. Um, so, yes, Canadian legacy media, um, people never stop complaining about it, and a lot of those complaints are accurate. Um, but there are more and more options for people who, uh, who are making those complaints. Do you think the funding that uh, Justin Trudeau and his federal government has provided to mainstream media has affected the way they report? I mean, it's such a popular complaint of people like me on the on the. Well, I'm I always consider myself in the center. I'm left on some things, right on other things. But it seems like the legacy media, the mainstream media, is just constantly. There's they're nothing more than a mouthpiece for Trudeau. It looks like you look like. Rachel Gilmore is the most popular one now. It just seems to get behind everything. And yeah, you know, I don't know. It just seems like all the mainstream media seem to be in his pocket. I don't know. Do you think it's got a relationship? So I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable pointing to any one story and saying that story wasn't reported properly because Trudeau's government has given all this money to newspapers. Um, and I think one thing I would point out is the SNC Lavalin story. If memory serves, the Globe and Mail reported that story, which was massively embarrassing to Trudeau's government and led to the, the disgrace and the departure of Gerald Butts, his right hand man. Uh, if I remember correctly, the Globe and Mail reported that story shortly after those subsidies began. Unless I'm getting the chronology wrong. And, and there's been a number of, of blockbuster stories that newspapers have run have run um so it's it's not as if like the funding started coming and then newspapers just like fired all their anti-trudeau columnists you know national post still has rex murphy and he's he's 24 7 anti-trudeau right that said um we now have this situation in canada where it's hard to find media that aren't subs uh, ma magazine industry i can attest is subsidized up the yin yang uh, film, TV, radio less so. Um, in fact, you know, uh, I'm not sure how much funding AM radio gets at all, but uh, certainly if you're making a movie, if you're making a TV show in Canada, if you're publishing a book, if you're doing a magazine, and now if you've got a newspaper, uh, you're getting tons of funding. And during during COVID, the, the money um, was multiplied. So I, I know a small publisher, I won't say the name of it, I actually like the publisher very much, but uh, there's, I think there's two employees this publisher has, and they they literally they, they got a check for forty thousand dollars during COVID, saying you know you're in the cultural industry, we have a program for supporting cultural industry. Forty thousand doesn't sound like a lot if you're running a business, but for this business where I think you know the total cost for the year is maybe one hundred fifty thousand, it was huge. This is on top of the regular subsidies they were getting. So if it were just newspapers, maybe you could excuse it, but like it's hard to find media in Canada that isn't government bankrolled. On top of the fact that you have the CBC, which is explicitly, you know, it's, it's a national broadcaster. It gets well over a billion dollars. And at the provincial level, you have TVO, although, which is TV Ontario. TVO, I think, is more scrupulous about um, being politically neutral than CBC. The other thing is anybody who works in a newspaper, if they're honest with themselves, will know that it's absolutely the case that money affects editorial position and, and put aside politics. When I was at the national post, uh, it was, and I think this is true of, of many newspapers. I shouldn't single out the national post, but that's the example I'm familiar with. Uh, if you look at the section of, you know, the weekly section where you have, um, articles about cars, all of the ads are by auto manufacturers. And guess what? The reviews of the cars tend to be positive because Toyota is not interested in placing an ad in a weekly car section in a newspaper where on the front page, it's like, you know, the new Corolla is, is, is crappy. Like that's just, that's not, mm -hmm. so you don't see a lot of articles like that. And I know that 
you know, when I was when I was at the newspaper, um, some of the airlines were huge advertisers. And guess what? Those airlines have the ability to stop distributing your newspaper on flights. And newspapers love being distributed on flights because you get a lot of really upscale uh, passengers who are a captive audience. They're there on the airplane for a couple of hours. Um, you're putting high profile, you know, you're putting high end advertisers in front of them. These tend to be people with a lot of disposable income. So if Air Canada or Porter says, you know what, we're not interested in carrying your newspaper anymore, or we're not interested in ad advertising anymore, that's might very much affect your editorial position on issues related to air travel. Uh, and, and this is, this is not something people who work in newspapers will say explicitly. I mean, I absolutely, I know for a fact this goes on at Globe and Mail because I have friends the Globe and Mail. I know for a fact it goes on at Toronto Stars, but it, it's not, it goes on at every newspaper. It probably goes on at the New York Times too. And the question then becomes, well, if corporate money is skewing editorial decisions, at least at the edges, and it is, it's just, I think people in editorial positions push back against this. They they try and do the right thing uh, and often they do, but it's, it's impossible to always do the right thing when that kind of economic pressure exerts itself. If that's happening in response to corporate advertising money, why wouldn't it have the same effect when it comes to government money? Like money is a fungible asset. And if you're trying to make corporate actors happy when they give you the money, why would you suddenly constantly be on the side of angels when it comes to government and actors giving you money? It's it, it doesn't make sense that you would be able to compartmentalize those two. That said, you know, I don't want to identify anyone's story and say, well, that story was badly reported because of this. My, my, what I'm arguing here is just the general tendency is that money talks. And to the extent money talks and the Trudeau government has emptied up a lot of cash for a troubled industry, mm -hmm. it's, it's inevitable that some editorial decisions are going to be influenced by that money. You got a prediction on the troubled industry? Are we going to continue to subsidize it? It's, it's got, it, I mean, in my opinion, if you can't swim, you sink. I mean, you should need the government to bail you out every time, you know, there's hard times. We're going through, obviously, a digital shift, digital shift in, in how we report news and stuff like that. But how do you see the future of Canadian legacy media? They, can we continue to keep funding them like this or do we have to make them swim on their own? But everything you just said, so, you know, uh, you know, supply and demand, we're in the middle of a digital shift. Uh, People said that 20 years ago. Um, mm. 20 years ago in Toronto, there were four major newspapers. Uh, there was, you know, The Sun, The Star, The National Post, and The Globe and Mail. It's now 20 years later, and there are four major newspapers in Toronto. And if newspapers were like any normal industry, you'd have consolidation. You would have, you know, lower print supply. I mean, there is lower print supply to meet the lower demand. Um, but you wouldn't still have four players. You might have three players or two players or one player. Mm. Canada is a little different because we have foreign ownership rules on, on cultural assets. And um, so, right. you know, it's, it, it makes it trickier. And also there's like, sometimes people, this happens in the United States a lot where people want to own a newspaper in the same reason they want to own like a basketball team. It's just kind of it's seen as a high profile asset. It's a brand builder for billionaires. Um, but I predicted 20 years ago that like exactly what you just said, it's like, well, you know, it's the laws of gravity exist for all industries. And how can you have four major players in the Toronto market? Like you go to a city, you, know, you go to comparatively sized cities in the United States, like, like Houston, um, or, or Chicago or, you know, cities in Florida, uh, they're, you don't have four major newspapers in these markets. Uh, and it's it's pretty apparent that this government money came at a time when there was a real, I mean, it was one of many financial crises the newspaper industry was facing. But it was, I mean, it was kind of embarrassing. You had the publishers of the, the, the four major newspapers like writing op-eds in each other's newspapers saying, we need a bailout, we need government money. And so, you know, you'd open the National Post, which I, to me, I find it especially embarrassing in regards to the National Post, because the National Post 
really since its inception in 1998 has been a flag a flag bearer for laissez-faire free market capitalism especially on the opinion pages of the financial post and then you know you open it up and it says well we need government money or we're going to go bankrupt like it's it's it, it feels hypocritical for the star it wasn't as hypocritical because they want everything subsidized so you know guess okay you know add newspapers to the list it's 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 actually more in keeping with their overall editorial positions on other things um but it's it's an un look there's there's many people who this is how they make their living this is how they feed their family so it, it feels grinch like for me to say oh yeah you know sink or swim sink or swim um but it has to be recognized that there's a certain hypocrisy at play for a free market newspaper that tends to take a free market position on you know, it's, its entire existence since Conrad Black started, it was based on laissez-faire capitalist principles uh, to, to then when, when it's in trouble, campaign so nakedly for government subsidies and successfully. Uh, so that, that, you know, I, don't, I don't wish ill on, on any of these publications, but you know, there's good people who work at them, but you can't turn a blind eye to the hypocrisy. You can't pretend it's not there. I'm going to comment on YouTube about the false mass graves narrative. It's a pinned tweet on your Twitter account. I know you've written extensively on the subject. Talk to me about, you know, calling Canada a genocidal state. So, well, I mean, I guess to a certain some extent, this is two different issues. In terms of the, the graves, you know, what I have said is that um, Canada has done so many horrible things to Indigenous people. Um that there is this kind of lurid appetite among um, Canadian, not indigenous Canadians, but I would say sort of, you know, Canadian urbanites, uh, media figures and stuff there. They, they have properly focused on all these horrible things that Canada has done to indigenous people. And so when this spectacular claim was, was aired in late May, 2021, where it was said, well, you know, we, we have brown penetrating radar data that's consistent with the possibility that there are over 200 formerly unknown unmarked graves of indigenous children. Uh, and, you know, th these were these were believed to be there by um, by knowledge keepers in the indigenous community. It was natural that everyone would say, oh, my God, this is yet another horror that we have visited upon indigenous people. And, and I was one of the people I, I, when I saw the headlines, uh, I, I assumed that this, this was an absolutely real story that was going to be 219 child bodies that, you know, in the same way that you would investigate any other mass murder site. Cause it was alleged, it wasn't just alleged that this was like evidence of horror. It was, a common claim was that this was evidence of mass murder. And what do you do with mass murder sites? You, you, you investigate the evidence. You try and find, use that evidence to try and find the people who did this. Uh, a lot of these uh, supposed crimes were supposed to have been done like in the 50s and 60s. The, the wrongdoers could still be around. They could be tried and sent to jail if the evidence is marshaled. And I just assumed, you know, much as, um, you know, remember that, that horrible story, uh, the Picton farm out in, near Vancouver, uh, I think there was, there was almost two dozen women who were found buried there by that mass murder. Like no time was wasted in, uh, many of those women were indigenous and, and they were unearthed. And, um, it was, it, was, it was a huge criminal investigation. Everything was done according to the protocols, uh, that you would expect of a mass murder investigation. And here compared to Picton, you know, you have, uh, t 10 times the, alleged number of victims and younger, you know, children, kids still in diapers. Uh, so I just assumed that within days, this evidence would be on earth. Uh, but then of course the days passed and the weeks passed and the months passed and it's now been more than 16 months. And it now seems to be the case that yes, we still have that GPR data, although no one was allowed to take a particularly close look at that GP, GPR data, even back in 2021. And no one seems to be in a hurry to, to investigate it. And we hear like vaguely, well, you know, it's, you have to, 
put in place the proper protocols and uh, consultations and this and that. It's like, I don't, it's a mass murder scene. If it's really the scene of mass murders, you, you don't waste time with spiritual protocols. You, you treat, treat it with the seriousness that any other mass murder scene would, would call for in terms of legal uh, and investigative protocols to do otherwise to me is racist. You know, if if I told you that 219 white kids were buried in a park outside Toronto and there was GPR data supporting that, I, I absolutely guarantee before nightfall there'd be investigators like putting up yellow tape, digging up the ground, finding evidence. Surely Indigenous children, their lives we are worth as much as white children. So how come no investigation has been done? And this is seen as impolite to say in Canadian society and journalistic circles um, that, well, may, maybe they're, they're not there. Maybe Canada entered a social panic based on incomplete data because ground penetrating radar data indicating anomalies, you know, soil, soil dislocations at regular spaced intervals could be consistent with many things. It could be consistent with agricultural use. It could be consistent with former investigations of the ground. It could be uh, consistent with, you know, with, with orchard usage. Um, and, and the fact that it hasn't been investigated, I, with few exceptions, the Canadian media has been staring at its shoes for 60 months because many of the reporters and editors and broadcasters who went in super hard on the story, they don't want to have to go on air or in print and say, so remember we said that. Uh, this is the moment of Canada's shame. Remember when Trudeau dropped the flag on federal buildings for five months? Remember when he sank to his knees with a teddy bear? Uh, yeah, you know, so it turns out that all that stuff, we kind of jumped the gun on it. And just to be clear, it still could absolutely be the case that that actual human remains are found. That, um, I don't know, 219, hey, maybe it'll be more than 219. You don't know until you properly investigate it. But I think it's a journalistic scandal that it was journalists who propelled the political class and ordinary Canadians into a state of absolute social panic about Canada being like this genocide child killer state. And then when the evidence wasn't there, people just walked away from the story, didn't even admit that, that they'd screwed up. And uh, I think I wrote a long article about this, not the article that's pinned or not anything that's pinned to my Twitter right now, but the New York Times, which is not Canadian media, but which is widely read in Canada, they were the worst offender. Uh, you had a, a reporter, Ian Austin, uh, it, was, you know, it was right there in the headline in his article, he talked about mass graves. And and on this score, even indigenously, he said, we never talked about mass graves, the idea of like an, a big pit where bodies are stacked like cordwood, um, like the sort of things you find out of, you know, near Auschwitz or, um, you know, uh, the Ukrainian famine or the Armenian genocide or in Rwanda um, or under Pol Pot in Cambodia. You know, these, these images circulated because people had this ghoulish appetite to have these, these ideas as a symbol of the enormous guilt that Canadians rightly feel about many of the policies. And it symbols become very precious to people and these 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 the idea that of these child graves became oddly precious to many members of the intellectual class because it gave a kind of concrete vision an idea and number um a narrative that like really acted as a metaphor for for how horrible canada was and it legitimized like just a lot of over-the-top rhetoric about canada being a genocide state and and those symbols and those ideas were <laughs> turned out to be so precious that when the evidence wasn't there, no one wanted to walk it back. And, and this is something you're not allowed to say. I mean, I mean, to his credit, Terry Glavin of the National Post said it, he wrote this definitive 6,000 word article that, you know, I, I wrote on that article's coattails. Uh, Dorchester Review wrote an, uh, ran an article about it. The New York Post has run articles about it. Foreign media has no problem running articles about this because they're not bound by our, our uh, unwritten rules about what you're allowed to say. But in Canadian media, mainstream media, Terry Glavin and the National Post are the only mainstream Canadian media outlets that have explicitly put their hand up and said, we got suckered on this story. This, wow. the, the narrative that, that came out, again, bodies may still be found. 
you know, you can't, in this case, you can't prove a negative. And I, I will be the first to say that if anybody says, oh, no, there are no body investigations, but it's also the case that you, you absolutely cannot say there are 219 bodies there. You certainly can't say that those bodies are those of children. And furthermore, they're, they're indigenous children. And furthermore, they were murdered. Like all of these things, just these lurid extrapolations of what we have, which is GPR data, um, without proper investigation, it's 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 speculative. Uh, and it's crazy that reporters across the country who, who prize themselves on like their hard-bitten journalistic acumen and getting all the facts and acting, asking the tough questions and um, you know, not trusting anybody and double checking all your sources and fact checking, they just went in hook, line, and sinker mm. on the basis of preliminary uh, radiological evidence. It's 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 astounding. You're right. Um, and the international media, so yeah, that was, was right that, in on it. I mean, you mentioned the New York Times and the international media picked it up and and ran with it. It was the, you know a cover story for a long time. And but uh, then but then they they also there were a few outlets that raise their eyebrows later on um the new york post i think the daily mail um so so i mean that was a double-edged sword because at first it's absolutely true they were signal booster new york times especially uh were a signal booster on the original social panic but then when the story started to fall apart months later they were also more likely not the new york times i should say but they were more likely to say oh okay this this uh, this wasn't quite as it was presented originally. And in Canada, the only large mainstream outlet that has done that is the National Post, to its credit. What's your take on the level of wokeism? Do, are, are we suffering suffering a wokeism infection? Uh, are we infected by, if, I don't know how else to put it other than white guilt, especially in the media. It seems like we're so easy to say, oh yeah, we did it, we did it, we did it, we're guilty. So it's interesting you know, I play a lot of disc golf. I go to a lot of board game tournaments. I, I I do volunteer work, and I, as a result, I meet people who aren't in journalism. They just want to like play sports or you know run a food bank or um, play board games. Or you know, I meet parents like my my one of my kids is a great athlete, and I spend a lot of time in arenas and volleyball tournaments and stuff. And and so I meet people who aren't like permanently on Twitter and, and who don't have jobs as journalists or politicians, and they don't really think about this stuff that much. And, and if, you, if you say, hey, what do you think about this, you know, this woke stuff on school boards? And they're like, oh, yeah, those people are clowns. Like, God, you know, what's pronouns, right? Who cares? Like, they, they're exasperated and they treat it as a laugh line. But they it doesn't really affect their lives that much because you know if you're if you run a restaurant usually you don't care what people's pronouns are you know you, you want to make your customers happy you want to treat everybody with respect uh and you're not in this like highly symbol dense land of academia and journalism where like you're always trying to build your own brand by like you know putting pronouns in your profile and blm and uh, making sure, you know, a couple of months ago, you know, you were always masked when you had a photo. Like, ordinary people don't care about stuff like that. And um, so I think sometimes people like you and me, we sometimes maybe exaggerate uh, how how much this is kind of like ruining society. And and I, I, like, I'm very careful, you know, when I write my articles and stuff like that, you know, I try not to use apocalyptic language like, you know, this is, this is destroying our civilization or something like that. Um, I think if you were an academic or a journalist or an activist, um, or you're in one of these subcultures that has become highly co-opted by some of these like more rarefied forms of progressive dogma, it can really make daily life and, and even like basic communication impossible. I just today, actually, I ran a piece by a prominent Jewish activist in New York, uh, who works out of New York City. And he says, like, if in the Jewish community since 2016, he, he wrote a, a detailed piece on this for me. 
um, it's hard even just to have a conference call because someone will just say something very banal um, and, 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 and some young staffer will jump on them and say, like, that's a very privileged thing to say. You need to walk that back. The example he gave, this is, you know, he, he personally wrote an op-ed about how, hey, do Jewish, he runs a Jewish community organization. Do, do Jewish community organizations, do we really need all these expensive offices in like Midtown New York? Like, you know, during COVID, we've, we've operated really well from home. Maybe we should think about that. You know, we could make better use of, of donor funds without like renting, you know, 2,000 square feet in, in the heart of America's most expensive city. And then someone jumped on him and was like, oh, that's a very privileged thing to say because you're just assuming that people have a big place at home where they can work. Uh, maybe you do, but other people don't. And he hadn't really said that. And But then the whole conversation was sidetracked about that. Like, that's what it became. Mm. That, you know, one person said it. And then I know people in government who, um, you know, they have a big conference call to discuss something. And, you know, someone will pipe up and say, well, I wanted to attend this conference in person, the, you know, this meeting in person. But I came by our government building the other day and I saw a construction worker not wearing a mask and I felt very unsafe. So I went home. Wow. And then like the next 30 minutes are like, why does Marcy feel unsafe? And we need to support Marcy. Hashtag I support Marcy. <laughs> and but but that's that's what happens. That's what's happening in government. This is what's happening in academia. Like these are places that have a very weak association with market discipline. It's it's absolutely not happening. And I know this because I have close relatives who work in these industries. I, it is absolutely not happening in the construction industry. It is absolutely not happening um, in like the computer manufacturing industry. It might happen, you know, people who make computer video games, highly symbolic products and, you know, creative types and stuff, they have to cater to them. But like, if you're making semiconductors, uh, if you're making weapons uh, to to help Ukraine fight Russia, you're not spending your whole day having these inane conversations about why Marcy is falling to pieces because she saw someone without a, without a mask or, um, you know, whether people need to have pronouns in their email signatures. Like the, the subcultures where this kind of conversation is happening tend to be highly subsidized, uh, you know, very avant-garde, highly rarefied professional subcultures that don't have market discipline. Uh, and so they're kind of like they've been free to operate as a sort of a playpen for this kind of stuff. But these industries account for a fairly small percentage of the human population. Um, we hear a lot about them because they've been generating a lot of scandals in this regard lately. But it, I think we sometimes exaggerate how much effect it has on the lives of, of ordinary people. And when ordinary people notice, they kind of rebel against it. Um, and, and I think we're starting to see that a little bit. Um, it might affect the upcoming school board elections here in Ontario. It certainly was part of the Trump phenomenon. But like, you know, the Trump phenomenon kind of bothered me a little bit because Trump was always going on about political correctness, right? And and some of the stuff he said was right. And he used it as a campaign issue. And people would say, oh, I support Trump because he's against political correctness. And I'd say, really? Well, okay, you know, uh, the other day he made fun of uh, an Ameri a, a Muslim American soldier who, who gave his life in i think it was afghanistan um because like his mom wore uh traditional uh you know islamic uh, it was a head covering it wasn't a veil it was head covering it was like this i think it was a pakistani american soldier given his life to the united states and trudeau went after the guy's mom because like she was wearing a head covering i think she spoke at the democratic national convention and he says yeah he's like you know trump the guy would say trump is is fighting political correctness he has no time for like all this islamic stuff and it's like well actually i think it's just trump being an asshole and sometimes when people say oh i'm i'm against political correctness sometimes what they're talking about is they're just supporting people who are rude and abusive and bigoted and we have to be careful about that because not everything that's that's rude and abusive and bigoted is just political correctness Some, sometimes obeying those rules is just basic decency uh and so you know, I've learned to be sort of careful on both sides this, of, of this argument and not to just give a free pass to conservatives who are weaponizing the political correctness issue to be, you know, legitimately transphobic or legitimately racist or Islamophobic. Um, it becomes very easy when you're on the right wing side of the culture war to imagine that these are these are all just imaginary problems. And, and they're not, you know, if you're 
you're Muslim, like you do face Islamophobia sometimes. It's you know, racism is real. Uh, Anti-Semitism is sometimes real. You know, I, you mentioned like I start my tweets off that I say as a Jew, I like to remind people that I'm a Jew because if you read the media, sometimes you think like Canada is deluged by anti-Semitism. And I can tell you it absolutely is not. Um, anti-Semitism very rarely affects my life. I think Canada is not an anti-Semitic country at all. But occasionally there is anti-Semitism. And when it is, we should call it out. You know, this Leif Maruf guy was a genuine anti-Semitic nut. Um, but but I, I think it's important to say these problems are real, but rare. Yeah, Not and I think that's problems. that's what gets lost in this whole argument. And I've been saying this for a long time. I've got lots of minority friends, and you know, if I ever asked them on on what type of level do you experience like true racism, it's not a daily thing. It's not even a monthly thing. It's so rare, and then we overplay this. That you know, and we've got our government telling us that we're you know the RCMP is steeped in racism. That uh, you know, systemic racism goes through all our culture and all our institutions. And, you know, I'm just so tired of hearing that we're racist when, yes, racism exists. Where it exists, it's horrible. And I'll stand beside anyone that's a victim of it. But don't tell me that my government is racist. Don't tell me that, you know, institutions are inherently racist. Yeah, sometimes it happens. We got bad judges. We got bad apples and everybody. It's the minority. It happens. I mean, I'm white, so they'll just tell me I'm privileged for saying this, that I don't experience racism. But, I mean, you can't offend me as a white guy. It doesn't matter what <laughs> what trope you use or what, you know, honky or whatever racist term you try and use on me. I don't know. I think it's funny. <laughs> I think it is. That's so humor. I, I, I do think that when, when people say, oh, you can't be racist against white people, Obviously, you can be racist against any people. There's a grain of truth to that. I mean, in the sense that if, if you're defining racism as something that is defined as part of the existing power structure, and you say, well, you know, whites have more power in society, and therefore you can say something that's that's rude or nasty about white people, but it's not racist in the sense of attacking black people since you're attacking people who are oppressed and... I kind of get that. Like, I, I think it's silly to say that you can't be racist against white people. I mean, there's obvious some people just are absolutely racist against white people. It's a, it's a silly thing to say. There's a little bit of a grain of truth to that. What gets me more is when people go beyond the racism thing and they talk about Canada being a white supremacist society. Like, they actually use the term white supremacist to describe uh, Canadian society. And this or, or politicians. is something now this that's is new, like uh, just become a very school. normal part of discourse. It's super weird to me because, so yeah, you're like, if, again, it's so happens I'm Jewish. And so like I spent a lot of my youth learning about the Holocaust and learning about anti-Semitism and stuff like that. And only we learned about movement. Um, in South Africa, you had a white supremacist movement where, you know, they had explicit laws that uh, about whites being superior to blacks, like it wasn't a secret. And then, so that's kind of the way that term is encoded in my brain. And then to, to, to then be in a Canada in 2022, where white supremacy is used as like this really casual way to describe things like microaggressions and stuff. And I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, so you have a uh, here in Toronto, you have OCAD. You know what OCAD is? It's the Ontario College of Art and Design. It's 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 one of the premier art and design uh, post secondary institutions in Canada. Okay. I think mm -hmm. uh, it has a big sort of um, architecturally prominent campus in uh, oh, what is it's like Dundas, uh, out west near, near the near the museum. You know, beautiful place. Many talented artists have graduated there. The woman who has run it for the last five years. She's an American, happens to be a black woman. She's um, a, a, a rightly celebrated artist, um, an academic who was brought in from the United States. She ran OCAD for five years and now she's, uh, she's, she's outgoing, she's leaving. And she gave an interview, uh, I think with Azure magazine, which is sort of artsy magazine. And I read the, re I read the, her article and she just, casually called Canada a white supremacist, white supremacist settler state. Wow. And for those who aren't part of the discourse, the settler 
means you're not indigenous. Mm -hmm. It's it's a pejorative term, but look, it's, we don't have time to talk about that. But I was like, wait a sec. And, and then I went on the Ontario Sunshine List, which gives the salaries of anybody who makes over $100,000 from the Ontario government because she's a, a provincial employee because OCAD is a, is a public college. So she was brought in from the United States to run OCAD. For the last five years, she's imposed all of these affirmative action programs, which, you know, I guess it's, it's her right. Um, you know, she was hired to do the job and she, she had an agenda and she did it. It's, uh, but she was paid $183,000 about per year. So over the last five years, she paid, she was paid $900,000 in taxpayer money to run OCAD and to implement all of these affirmative action programs for students and for staff. Okay. You may agree with that. You may disagree with it, but to then on her way out say, oh, and by the way, this is a white supremacist country. If this is a white supremacist country, we're really bad at being white supremacist <laughs> with like providing all of this government funding to a celebrated woman of color whose, whose explicit agenda was uh, putting this like highly ambitious program of affirmative action at OCAD, uh, getting paid a ton of money for the privilege. And then on the way out, casually smearing the entire country as if we're like apartheid era South Africa or Nazi Germany. Yeah. And, 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 and in Azure, again, this is Azure is prestigious public, you know, maybe somewhat obscure to, to many readers, but very prestigious. This was just like the interview was sort of a Q and a, this, this interview, it was just like, she was saying, Oh, it's sunny outside yeah, like or, um, you know, I, you know, I'm wearing a scarf, like just this sort of matter of fact thing. Oh, and Canada's a white supremacist settler state. Yeah. That too. Like, it's just taken as this banal statement of the world we live in. And that's insane. Because if, if Canada is a white settler, if Canada is a white supremacist country, what words do we use to describe a country that actually does implement white supremacist policies? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's say like, like the country of Latonia starts imposing Nazi or apartheid like laws and starts, you know, saying, you know, restaurants can put up signs that say no dogs or Jews. Um, blacks have to have their own separate drinking fountains. Uh, Muslims can't join certain professions. Uh, Hispanics have to leave. Um, you know, Uzbeks have to register with the government. Like, let's say they started to do an actual white supremacist program. What language would we have to describe it? Would we say, oh, they're racist? Well, we're racist. That they're bigoted, that they're, uh, that they're white supremacist that they're that they're nazi adjacent i mean all of these terms we've used to describe canada which is one of the most celebrated democracies on the planet hundreds of thousands of people come here precisely because we're a wonderful tolerant nation um we routinely come in the top five in all of these international indexes of like places people want to live and places that are seen as free and prosperous and tolerant and multicultural and if Canada is casually labeling itself as a white supremacist crap hole, what English words exist to describe genuine white supremacist crap holes, of which history is bound to provide us with a few examples, you know, history being what it is, like, these things are, are, are cyclical. I mean, we're already seeing stuff happening in Ukraine that I never thought I'd saw in my lifetime, uh, you know, war on that level of belligerence happening um you know open war warfare in europe like i i didn't think that would happen what what else are we gonna see and then when it comes we're not gonna have the vocabulary to denounce it and we've already seen this like when china was being denounced internationally for its treatment of of the uyghurs uh and language of like genocide was used chinese officials openly mocked canada and said oh right uh this is canada the place where you're uh According to you know your own prime minister, you're digging up the bodies of kids, right? You're a genocide state. You said it yourself, and and then we're like we're staring at a shoe. We have nothing to say. It's true. Our media said it. Our prime minister said it, and then we have no moral stature to to call out countries like China, which really are engaging in, in horrible human rights abuses. You know this. Uh, you talked about this this pin tweet I have. Uh, this is a Quillette article I, I wrote on September 23rd. If people want to visit, it's my pin tweet. The title, which I think says it all, it says Canada called itself a genocide state. Iran was listening because Iran, too, you know, their, the Ayatollah gave a speech about the hypocrisy of, of Canada and saying, 
oh yeah, these guys digging up the apparently digging up the bodies of little kids that they murdered, uh, telling us that uh, you know we should uh, that we're a human rights violator, crimes against humanity, all that stuff. He's laughing at us, and and I'm absolutely not on the side of Iran, but I kind of admire the chutzpah of this guy calling us out for our hypocrisy when just saying nonsense about our own country and then trying to weaponize that language against other countries. And, and they're not, the Ayatollah is not stupid. President of China isn't stupid. They, they have people who read our media and know what kind of nonsense we say about ourselves. So when we try and call them out for genuinely bad behavior, they're, uh-uh, you, you already used that language and you used it about yourself. So you're a joke. And that was predictable and now it's happening. And, and now we have no moral status on the world stage to call. This was supposed to be Canada's big deal, right? You know, remember, you're old enough, soft power, multilateralism, you know, Canada was supposed to be a light onto nations. We were, you know, we were pacifistic and uh, we were gonna use the United Nations and other multilateral bodies to like bring out the better angels of all these other countries. This was our brand, right? In contradistinction, the United States. And that brand is in the toilet now because we've called ourselves a genocide state and no one wants to listen to lectures from a genocide state. And that's the problem with throwing around terms like Nazi and bigot and homophobic and transphobic. And, and like, I mean, uh, that is the problem with being loose with the language like that, too. Uh, I want to keep you on time, but I want to get your take on uh, on the state of mental health, especially of our kids. It seems it's kind of my underlying commitment, even though I don't have children. It seems that when I'm uh, flung into rage, it's always got something to do with the kids. I did not like them being masked in schools. I didn't like how we treated the school system and is still treating their, our kids. Um, I'm concerned with the level of, um, well, the way this... <laughs> Well, the state's euthanizing people as young as 23 years old now, it seems like. Um, transitioning pu- pre-pubescent girls, like, before, can we let them hit puberty? Like, you know, I, I just said to a friend of mine the other day, like, if you went into a coma 10 years ago and they woke you up today, you wouldn't believe what we tolerate now that 10 years ago we thought was a horror show especially when it comes to kids. So just your take on mental health and especially as it, as it uh, pertains to, to the kids. Um, so it actually surprises me how sophisticated kids are about mental health. Cause there is this fashion among not just conservatives, but you know, even centrists and culture critics, it's like these kids are snowflakes and, and it, it, so it is true that like when you listen to the discourse of kids and not maybe more so like the adults who are supposed to be the voice of reason in the room is sort of indulging them. You know, this guy who wrote a piece for me for Quillette, uh, his, his kid who's like 13 or 14, they took a photo, they had like a Nerf gun, you know, those guns that fire like spongy Nerf pellets. Yeah. It's a, it's a toy. Yeah. And they took photos of, of themselves, like firing the gun at each other and like Jeez. holding this Nerf gun to their head and pretending <laughs> to be like criminals. It's, just, it's like, you know, it's if, if I had done this, it would be like the 187,000th stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and, and, and so they were Snapchatting these photos to their friends and it wasn't on school property. And the guy who wrote this piece for me, the principal called them in and said, like, we're suspending your kids for three weeks. And... The, the dad was like, what the hell, why? He says, well, you know, this these these violent images that were circulated in school with guns. It's like, it's like, dude, that's a Nerf gun. And yeah, the photos were kind of dumb, like in this day and age, you know, school shootings, and I get it, like, but you're suspending them for three weeks. And the guy's like, no, you know, these kids don't feel safe because, of, and, and it, I don't know how many kids didn't feel safe because of that, probably zero. But it was, in this case, it was the adult who was acting like, like an idiot and mm-hmm. the snowflake and sometimes kids get a bad rap, but sometimes it's the adults who are co-opting their supposed vulnerability. That said, um, kids are more fragile now. And it's a lot of it's social media. And I see it. I see it in my kid. I, every parent these days sees it. Anxiety disorder, um, fear of confrontation, insecurity, especially, especially for girls. And studies have confirmed this, that the effects of Instagram in particular on the psyche of girls has been awful. Um, 
you know, this thing where like you put a new pro profile pic and unless you get 50 likes within the first half hour, mm. it means you're a pariah. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, I guarantee you and me, we could change our profile pic on Instagram. Um, we wouldn't get 50 likes in the next decade. But <laughs> True for enough. some of these girls, um, like they're, they now have this ruthlessly systematic accounting and publicly accessible accounting mechanism that catalogs their level of influence and popularity among their peer group. And, you know, I was kind of a loser when I was in middle, middle school, but there wasn't a website people could go to and say, well, here's, here's a quantitative index that proves John K is in like the lowest quote quartile of <laughs> like popularity in a school. I mean, everybody knew I was in the lowest quartile, quartile of popularity. But it was just kind of like it's one thing to kind of know it and it's another thing that there's a publicly accessible website where people right. can, can get that information mm -hmm. and i think for guys for boys maybe less so they get more immersed in sports uh or like magic the gathering or pokemon or um they can find little nerdy subcultures within their larger social environments that insulate them to some degree for whatever reason, that's not as much the case with girls, especially in middle school. Um, and the health, mental health ramifications have been enormous. And and I've I've been lucky with my own family, but I've seen it in in peer groups. And uh, partially, it's just you know it's a classic you know immune response thing where they they are protected so much that they haven't developed some of the the resilience required to navigate the slings and arrows of of outrageous fortune, as they say. Uh, part of it is helicopter parenting, um, and but that is it's a real thing, and if you see it, it not not to high school, you see it university level. Uh, in early September, I dropped my eldest off at um, at university. She's doing engineering. God bless her. And there were thousands of parents dropping their kids off, and you know, thirty years ago, these kids would be taking the train to school. Now they're being dropped off and every parent had the same conversation with them. Like you have my text, you have my phone number. If you need anything, text me, you know, I can be back here tomorrow if you've forgotten anything. And, um, they're, they are living in a bubble and to, because of electronic technology, university more and more is an extension of high school in terms of the cocoon that they, they inhabited. Their social networks are not composed of the people they go to school with. A lot of it's their social networks are populated by the people they were, uh, you know, Snapchat friends with in high school, and they, they're still enmeshed in some of those sometimes unhealthy networks. So all of that is real. Enter into that, a bunch of activists telling especially girls, oh, you're depressed, you have anxiety, maybe you're a dude. Uh, maybe it's, you know, this transphobic society that's forcing a female gender role on you, but maybe you're a non-binary person and, and giving them this idea that um, by changing pronouns, by, by changing their appearance, sometimes, through, you know, surgery, drugs, all that, that usually comes later, that that will solve problems that are, are actually caused by environment, by trauma, by anxiety, by OCD, by autism, depression, like whatever, all of these things, unfortunately, have, been, have correlated with gender distress. Um, and, and I, I do think it's quite ghoulish that you have a small group of activists who, who pray, I don't think pray is the wrong word, who prey on children trying to exploit their mental health crises as a means to convince them that, you know, they're not actually girls, they're just, you know, they're defective boys who, who, who need to be fixed with uh, social transition and with surgery and with, with um, delaying puberty and all this stuff. It's, 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 it's really, uh, you're already starting to see legal re recourse against it in Britain. Uh, we're a couple of years late on that in Canada, but it's going to come. We need to get the lawyers involved because some of the stuff they're doing to these girls, girls especially, boys less so, but girl, it's sick. Um, it's being and it's being and the fact that it's being done under the pretense of being kind and caring and affirming, you know, all the rainbow angels are coming to visit you and sprinkle their fairy dust on you and turn you into a real little boy or girl like this, that just actually to me makes it more disgusting. Um, and, and they need to be held legally accountable. Gender dysphoria is a real thing. Uh, sometimes people do get psychological benefits from going through a transition when they have recalcitrant gender dysphoria. Um, it can act as a palliative for, for those people. 
Um, and, and I support it for those people who do have persistent um, gender dysphoria that doesn't resolve. However, um, that tends to be a minority of cases. And, um, and in other cases, I, I think it's just absolute, uh, absolutely reprehensible what's being done to, to these girls. Yeah, and it seems to be predominantly affecting middle to upper class white families yeah. so you don't see yeah. this in black communities or spanish communities the, 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 you see the, it to some extent but you know so i did a story on haverford college in uh in uh pennsylvania it's, it was near philadelphia um i guess like the the tuition there is like seventy thousand dollars everybody there is um high achiever and I, I was doing an unrelated story. I was doing a story on they, they were having a freak out over race. Uh, this was last year. And I did this big investigative expose. But I looked at some of their student data because they have a free college compared to other liberal arts schools as, as an unusually systematic means of serving students. Um, and I think it was, oh God, remember the statistics, close to 10, 12% of the students no more call themselves LGBT. And I think something like 6% of students, like 10 times more than the national average, call themselves either non-binary or trans. Wow. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this is a school for mostly, not exclusively, mostly rich white kids. Mm -hmm. And if you're a rich white kid who's depressed and your parents are taking you around to like five different therapists, one of them is probably going to say, oh, you know what, uh, what kind of toys do you like to play with? You know, uh, he's like, oh, really? That's let's let's talk more about that. Let's let's do some role playing. Let's do this. Let's do that. And and what was very interesting is if you look at the data, the the bipolar the kids who identified as bipolar, it's, it's bipolar. What am I talking about? Non-binary. Um, that's a terrible <laughs> mistake to make. The kids who identify as non-binary um, are much 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 more likely to self-identify as depressed, even more so than the students who identify as transgender. Because in the case of legitimately kids who actually have gender dysphoria, um, you know, that that's a condition, you know, it, to su some extent it can be treated. Um, but the kids who are using the language of saying they're non-binary, I think for a lot of kids, that's just, it's just this vague, it's a completely meaningless term, but it's this vague, meaningless term that basically says, help, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I, I don't feel like I fit in. I don't feel like I'm pretty, I don't feel like I'm handsome, uh, I don't feel like I, you know, fit in with the jocks, I don't feel like I fit in with the cheerleaders, there's something wrong, but but every everyone feels like that at some point in their life. Uh, you know, thank God when I was a kid, and I went through that phase um, of being depressed and not fitting in and feeling misunderstood that there wasn't somebody saying, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you're, you have this gender spirit inside you that, that needs to be affirmed and you're actually gender fluid or gender queer. And it's like that because that's just a label and it, it wouldn't actually help me fix my problems. It would just make me feel angry at the world because then instead of managing my depression, I just manage my anger at all those people who are supposedly like non-binary phobic. Um, and, and I think that's what's happening with a lot of these kids. Yeah. Well, you say it can be treated, but I think we've got laws against that type of thing in Canada now. So anyways, I, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Tre you. Treated often in the sense of like, you know, there are therapists trained in gender dysphoria, yeah. and you know, for a lot, for some of these kids, transition ends up being the right thing to do. What I'm saying treated is probably perhaps the wrong word, but there, there, there is a course of, um, there are professionals who you can go to and say like, you know, I'm gender dysphoric. What's what are my options? What's best practices? Stuff like that. It's the non-binary stuff is is trickier because <laughs> how do you affirm somebody in being non-binary? Like, what what does that even mean? Yeah, I think there's uh, a, a health official in Canada that actually, maybe it was in Canada I saw on Twitter today, and their mission is to get young kids transitioned as quickly as possible with as few as meetings as possible, with a, as little as one meeting to set them on a no, course no, for pure. No gatekeepers. No. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's the dogma. No gatekeepers. And, uh, oh, there was some uh, gender consultant at, at one, of, one of the big Ontario uh, public school boards, of course, uh, and and there they put out this pamphlet uh, 
um, you know, it was like a question and answer thing. And the question was, how do I know if my kid is really trans? And, and the answer was, if the kid tells you they're trans, they are trans, doesn't matter their age. And there's even a special section. It's like, well, what if they have mental illness? Doesn't matter. Um, you know, what, what, what about their age? Doesn't matter. Like absolutely nothing matters. Um, and which is insane because if you're a parent, like, you know, my, my one of my four year olds thought they were a dinosaur. Um, kids, kids have all kinds of screwed up ideas about who they are. You know, they sometimes they'll scream and say, so I, I, I must be adopted because I rare, uh, and they'll spend years like telling their friends they're adopted. It's like <laughs> kids come to believe cr crazy things. Like kids are weird. Adults are weird. Um, I don't believe most adults who self-identify as this or that. Why would I believe a kid who's, who's yeah, right. like, think of all the crazy phases that, that many people go through and, and we're absolutely dead certain about who they were during that time of life. And then you meet them a year later and it's like, um, well, it turns out, turns out I wasn't bisexual. It turns out I wasn't that like, you know, it's people just people like, I'm not complicated. I'm not punk rock anymore. Like, you know, you grow yeah, up. And I don't want to, you know, I want to compare being <laughs> trans to being punk. <laughs> Rock, although, well, you, you do know, go through phases, it, and I, I just think that you know, for the minority of of kids, and I, God bless them, you know, they're suffering with with something I can I cannot imagine for myself because, well, I have a pretty good relationship with my sexuality, thank God. But you know, it, it just seems like you, you're right. There, there's no gatekeepers, and, and the the people that are supposed to know better are are seem to be the one with the big push on it so so book recommendation so i just got a preview copy of this book i don't know if the title comes out yeah reversed it's, it's called 18 months a, a memoir of a marriage lost to gender identity the author's name is shannon thrace t-h-r-a-c-e and when i got it i was I, I was very skeptical it's like look you know it's i don't i don't want to read like culture war books it's if because it's, it's by somebody who was married to uh, a man who, after 14 years, said, oh, um, first he started cross-dressing, and then, uh, like, six months later, he said, I'm trans, and I'm a real woman, and you must be a lesbian because you're married to a woman, and, like, the uh, marriage fell apart, as, as these things typically do. It's actually a very, very sympathetic portrayal of, of a, a man going through a transgender crisis as a middle-aged man and trying to convince himself that, you know, wearing lingerie and, and like these very painful kind of 19th century corsets, like trying to make his body look like that of a woman. And the whole thing is kind of like the, the wife who wrote this book is trying to kind of encourage him and, and still be in love with him while, while he's descending into this kind of very narcissistic obsession with how he looks and everything's about waxing and surgery and, and all this and um uh as i was reading it you know it, it struck me that on both sides of the culture war it strips away we should have sympathy for people who are going through this kind of dysphoria i mean it, it how many marriages would be ruined by this like how how unlikely would it be that a marriage would be able to survive something like that? I'm sure some marriages do, but it's possible to be deeply suspicious of efforts to convince kids they're trans while also being sympathetic and supportive of people who genuinely do have real gender dysphoria, like the husband of the person who wrote this book. Like, I, as I was reading the book, I didn't like hate this person or I was like, I was trying to understand what was going on in the marriage, but um, I thought it was ludicrous that you know the male character the, the 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 husband is keeps telling her like just i'm a real woman i'm a real woman don't you get it and and you're like no you're not a real woman this is this is terrible and you're you're ruining her life too with your this, this sort of insistence like it's not helping you work through this issue and obviously the marriage is going to break up but i but i didn't hate that character like I, I i saw why they were doing it because their dysphoria created a sense of of urgency in them that they they just they needed the whole world to tell them they were a real woman even though they're, they're absolutely not and it's possible to feel sorry for a person who's lost touch with reality in that way while also like putting the safeguards and saying this this frame of mind shouldn't encourage children to have some children can develop it dysphoria is a real thing in a small minority of the population but it's not something you should encourage um it's something that manage you manage when it presents itself 
you know, so much of what I tweet about in the shows I do are because I'm pissed off. You know, I'm worried about our kids. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the state of politics in Canada and the world. And so with an effort to kind of leave this conversation on a positive note, <laughs> if that's even possible after all the issues that we've delved into today, who are you following? Who do you like in media? Who, who do you think's doing a good job? Who, who are you a big fan of these days in your own profession? Um, in my own profession, um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of the people I read and like are people who I have trust in because I know them, because I've met them, because I'm friends with. Um, Matt Gurney is a guy who uh, I fell in with him at the National Post. I like his stuff. Chris Selly, another National Post writer. I like him. Um, I, I, I be completely honest. I don't watch any Canadian TV news. I find it like absolutely unendurable. Uh, CBC in particular is, I mean, for all, I don't even have to recite the reasons. Everybody knows why the CBC just, you can't even watch it. Um, and global, unfortunately for, for much the same reason. Uh, there are, I mean, there are Twitter accounts I could name that I follow. Uh, Rupra, uh, I think Rupra Subramanya. Um, if I'm getting, I'm sure I'm mangling the last name. She did a lot of great reporting from the convoy in, in Ottawa. Uh, though, you know, when I follow Rupa, I disagree with her on some stuff. Um, I'm sure she disagrees with me on, on some stuff. Uh, there's some indigenous writers and accounts that, that I really like. They're fresh thinkers. They, they're very proud of, of their indigeneity, but they also are, you know, want their communities to have access to to the tools that will allow them to integrate into a modern economy. Um, I, I, I wish I could tell you, I mean, I subscribe to the National Post and I love reading it. Um, I, I wish I could tell you that there was like a critical mass of Canadian journalists that, that I love to follow. Uh, the, the, the truth is that it's, it's probably a much smaller group of journalists, Canadian journalists that I follow now than I did like say five years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and even the journalists that I like often they don't have the resources to do what they need to do. Um, like even to travel, um, you know, one of the sad things is when you read like a really thorough piece about some indigenous community near the Arctic or something, um, often that's, it's a New York times article because you know, those articles take like a $10,000 travel budget and Canadian newspapers don't have that. So, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a sad state of affairs. Um, and, and, and I don't think going back to what we talked about before, I think to a certain extent, the government, government money is sort of delaying the inevitable and these, you know, a lot of these places will hang on for a couple of years before the inevitable contraction and consolidation, but in the process, you know, the quality of the product gets affected. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see where we are in a couple of years, like whether some of these green shoots, whether, you know, true North is maybe five years from now, we'll be talking about true North as like legacy media. Um, well, maybe like, cause, cause right now it's alternative media, but, um, people still want to read something like the fact that post millennial and true North, um, and Substack, Quillette, all these places are booming. Uh, the fact people listen to your podcast, I've been talking, babbling away for an hour and a half and there's probably still 17 people listening. The fact they're still here, I mean, like how desperate are you to listen to John <laughs> after 90 minutes? like yeah. that if if you're listening to this that speaks to the the horrifying desperation people have uh for 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 something to to help guide them in these these times of crisis well self-deprecation i find sexy but uh you're a good interview <laughs> man and you're an interesting character and uh i appreciate the work you do i got a lot of time for guys like you and uh as we spoke you know about offline before we came live you know i find that you know, uh, someone like uh, Andy Lee that's doing the real heavy lifting of the investigative, uh, you know, what our legacy media should be doing with the huge budgets that they have. She doesn't have a budget and she's breaking some good stories like uh, Rupa, like you mentioned. I mean, these these people are digging and doing Rupa, the heavy lifting that... Uh, Rupa did more work in Ottawa during the, the Freedom... And I didn't support the Freedom Convoy. No, I, no, I became... I was against the Freedom Convoy, but I was more against the 
reaction to it. Social panic, the reaction to it, which was even crazier. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if you want to make me like the Freedom Convoy, please continue calling them a bunch of white supremacists, <laughs> even though, you know, I see photos of them. It's a bunch of Sikhs from Quebec. And it's like, right. oh, do white supremacists wear turbans now? Is that like the new look for white supremacists? Yeah. But Rupa did her reporting with a pair of shoes and a camera mm -hmm. and interviewed people, published photos on Twitter. You know, everyone says they hate Twitter, but without Twitter, Rupa, we wouldn't be saying Rupa's name. She did her reporting through, you know, with the National Post, but also through Twitter. Uh, and, and Andy Leith, I mean, she uses her brain. She asks questions and I mean, a lot of the scandals in Canada are in plain sight. And, and right. the school board is a great example. Like mm -hmm. the, they don't try and hide the crap they're trying to do to students. It's like they put it on their Twitter account, the front page. Yeah. like all this, and, and the, the media stares at the shoes cause they, don't, you know, they want to be seen as on the right side of reconciliation and critical race theory and all this stuff. And take, you know, Andy Lee, she says, Hey, look at this. What do people think of this? And sometimes if everybody else is ignoring it, that's a story yeah. uh, and good and good for her for getting those stories. All right, brother. I love you. I kept you over time today, but uh, thanks for the time. And uh, please, whatever you do, don't lose your uh, dry wit. It's my favorite Thank on you. Twitter, man. You're very kind. More tweets. Um, as a Jew. <laughs> As I, I was, was going to leave on that joke, but I thought it had been so long since he said it that people wouldn't get it. They just think I was weird. All right, talk uh, soon. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Bye. All right, John. John K., if you need him, uh, I told him I would keep him for an hour, and he was most generous. It was an hour and a half or more, and I appreciate his time. Oh, the first conversation... Uh, we had a lot more laughs. It wasn't as serious a conversation. I think we were talking about Tibet, Tabitha Sadi or Sudi or whatever. <laughs> whatever. Whatever happened to her, man? She was one of my favorite Twitter accounts. I used to troll her hard. But uh, uh, my th thanks to Jonathan K. And uh, the links are in the show description. If you need to get a hold of them, you know how to do it. Peace, love, hug your neighbor, and whatever you do. Take that mask off your kids. I'm out.